Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Gregory Wilpert, coming to you from Quito, Ecuador. Mexico has made much headlines recently. However, in a recent major article for Foreign Policy magazine, John Ackerman makes a strong argument for why Mexico is not a functioning democracy. In the article, he highlights political violence, corruption, and lack of political freedoms in that country, as well as points out the Obama administration's failure to address these problems in its relationship with Mexico. To talk to us about these issues, we are lucky to have John Ackerman with us today, who is joining us from Mexico City. John is a professor at, uh, for, at the Institute for Legal Research at the National Autonomous University of Mexico, editor-in-chief of the Mexican Law Review, and columnist for Proceso Magazine and La Jornada newspaper. Thanks for joining us, John. Thank you, Greg. Uh, pleasure, to, as always, to speak with uh, Real News with you in particular. Thanks. Well, let's begin with uh, the ways in which the, most of the media seem to be overlooking the deep problems in Mexican uh, politics and society today. One of the few issues that seemed to pierce this ignorance recently was uh, the disappearance of 43 students in Ayotzinapa, uh, Mexico, almost exactly 18 months ago. Uh, but it seems like this was just the tip of an iceberg. Can you tell us more about what is happening in Mexico with regards to these types of disappearances and political violence? Yes, well, uh, indeed, the case of the 43 students, um, these are student activists who were uh, taken and forcefully uh, disappeared uh, from the state of Guerrero uh, a year and a half ago, um, uh, put this on the international scene, the question of uh, not just violence and chaos, because um, everybody knows that we have a, a failed drug war, we have uh, violence, we have corruption, um, that there are serious problems in Mexico. But that this also has um, political undertones or overtones, if you want to say it more correctly. Because one of the things about these 43 students is that they were student activists who were protesting against neoliberal policies, and they were forcefully disappeared, not by another drug gang, but by agents of the state, um, a, a half a kilometer from um, two enormous military bases. And uh, the suspicion is that and not a suspicion, but um, uh, the, what's the, the investigations which have been happening over the last year and a half is that the military is actually directly complicit with this, which would not be a surprise because those military bases are there in Iguala, Guerrero, precisely since the 1970s of Mexico's dirty war. So we have a historical continuity here. Um, uh, so that broke sort of the bubble of the idea of, of Enrique Peña Nieto as somehow a modernizer. Uh, but still international public opinion and international politicians continue to treat with um, Enrique Peña Nieto and the federal government as if um, this was a, a normally functioning democracy. Uh, Enrique Peña Nieto is received with his arms open in international forums um, from Paris to Washington to China, um, when uh, we should be uh, much more clear about what is actually happening on the ground. Uh, people imagine that somehow uh, uh, the problems are just in society, narco trafficking, or just at the local level, corrupt local mayors. Um, the argument in my article in, in Foreign Policy, and what I argue in my Spanish stuff as well, is that um, the problem at the top, not at, it's not at the bottom. It's a structural system in which Peña Nieto himself and the federal cabinet are directly um, participating in this uh, violence and chaos and corruption, but politicized violence and corruption. We have um, dozens of political prisoners, for instance, in Mexico. Mexico is one of the countries which is most unsafe for journalists in the entire world. Um, uh, uh, municipal uh, mayors and politicians throughout the country are assassinated on a regular basis. Um, this is not a functioning democracy. It's, it's just a, a political system which from top to bottom is um, corrupted and needs some serious renovation from down up. Just to give us an idea of the scope of this problem, can you give us some numbers? I mean, we often hear about the numbers uh, of people who were killed in the drug war in Ciudad Juarez and, and so on. But what about this political violence? What are the estimates uh, for those kinds of numbers? There are uh, dozens of political prisoners. Um, uh, there, are, there are different ways of, of counting this up, but there are over 100 in the country. Um, there are particular cases which stand out. So, for instance, when people look at Venezuela, and since uh, supposedly Venezuela is that's a supposed an authoritarian country because they don't like the United States, um, there's lots of emphasis, for instance, on this uh, guy, Leopoldo Lopez. Well, here in Mexico, we have um, a, a much more extreme case of Nestora Salgado, who is an um, indigenous uh, uh, leader from uh, the state of Guerrero as well, Lulinala. Um, she's actually a U.S. citizen. She spent um, 20, 25 years or so in, in Seattle, Washington, working there, came back to her town and organized the community police force um, based on 
uh, uh, laws which recognize uh, the rights of indigenous communities to organize themselves for self-defense. Um, and once she started to use these um, police forces, for instance, to go beyond just petty crime, but actually investigate government corruption and um, narco politics, um, that's when uh, the state institutions went into action and put her into jail. Um, she, we, we just had a very important um, court case just yesterday, which has um, ordered the, the, her case to be redone, and she might actually get out of jail in the next couple of days. This could actually be the result of pressure that many of us have exercised internationally. But she's just one case. Um, there are dozens, for instance, of people from the state of Michoacan. Uh, one uh, important leader is very similar to Nestora Salgado, Jose Manuel Mireles, also organized his community for self-defense. The problem here is that um, both the military and the police forces and the narcos uh, are against the, the people. They're fighting against each other, um, and another of them are protecting the, the peace, so the people have to organize themselves to defend themselves. Um, and uh, once again, when those forces start to investigate and attack government corruption, um, that's when they are thrown into, into jail. In the state of Puebla, which is just south of Mexico City, uh, we have documented about 112 cases of different um, people de defending their, their land, environmental activists, um, journalists, uh, youth students, who are arbitrarily um, uh, thrown into jail over the last two years of this, the most recent governor. Um, since December 1st, 2002, I mean, this really started on December 1st, 2002, when Enrique Peña Nieto um, came into power, when the old guard pre-authoritarian party came into power. Um, since then, um, in almost every single um, um, protest, especially when students are out in the streets, uh, um, arbitrary arrests, um, arbitrary jailing, and even um, political assassinations are the, uh, the order of the day. So. Um, if this happened in, you know, once again, Venezuela or Cuba or, or, or Russia, this is immediately uh, uh, front page news. Uh, but in Mexico, since we're supposedly a, a democracy with a president who's uh, very pro-American and Italy are liberal, all of this is sort of um, put under the rug. Biden was here yesterday uh, and he gave uh, an interview to a newspaper which kind of suggested some of these things. But basically, um, he, he uh, backslapped on Peña Nieto. The same happened even with the Pope. The Pope was here last week, the great progressive Pope. Um, um, spoke a good game, but um, refused to uh, um, directly question and point the figure at the Mexican government actually being um, complicit with these, with this violence and this authoritarianism. So everybody just blames it on the narcos, blames it on, on, on local politicians when this is a structural national problem. Yes, that leads me actually to the next question, which is, how is this all organized? I mean, uh, you're, you're saying that uh, this is not just local, but this is organized on a national level. But mm -hmm. who exactly is, it be is behind this? I mean, you mentioned the PRI, but uh, who are they connected to? And to what is kind of the, the, uh, the organizational structure, if one can talk about that, uh, behind a, this kind of uh, violence? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't know how much time we have, but <laughs> uh, the, 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 the people who make up the federal government today, um, Enrique Peña Nieto himself and his closest uh, um, team within the, 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 the executive are all ex-governors uh, of states which to this day have not undergone any kind of, um, uh, let alone democratization, not even alternation in power. Um, in the state of Mexico, it's a, that, that's what one of the states is called, which ex, Enrique Peña was ex-governor and also one of his leading members of his cabinet, um, has been ruled by the same party, the party of the, Democrat, of the institutional revolution, the PRI, for 87 years. Um, his other important people in his cabinet, um, Osorio Chong, Joy uh, uh, Fetz from the state of Mexico, uh, Murillo Karam, who's no longer there, but he was the guy who, who bots the whole investigation, the 43 students. All these guys are ex-governors of states which have been controlled by the same party for 86 years. These are people who have no experience or respect or understanding of democratic politics or plural um, competition or, or, or transparency or, or accountability. Those are, these are words that they don't even understand. So what they have done is, and, and, and at the local level, at the state level, so that, I mean, there is a problem at the state level, but the, what we have are these um, informal networks of, of, of corruption um, between businessmen, between the narco traffickers themselves and, and and the government institutions, um, which has now, these same networks have now taken over uh, the federal government. We weren't in a good situation beforehand either with Calderon or with Fox, but now we've sort of the, 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 the depths of the informal mafia style politics, which what used to be particular characteristic of the local state level is now, um, has been nationalized, has been federalized. And when you put that together with the neoliberal assault, and the privatization of everything, right? <laughs> Most importantly, of oil and education and uh, um, 
uh, flexibilization of labor codes, um, then you have the interaction between sort of these old mafia style um, way of doing politics with uh, the new um, international high level corruption, which leads to this kind of explosive um, um, almost festive for them um, uh, um, a situation of, of new opportunities to use international financing to um, fund these these networks of uh, of corruption at the national level. So I don't know if I'm getting a, a a good picture out there, but that's that's what's really happening with the complete decay of any idea of of, of institutions uh, as uh, responsible for the people. Um, the, the national institutions are being used by these mafia networks to um, connect these uh, what used to be local networks to international financial flows, um, and this is leads to uh, uh, the international supposedly positive valuation of these guys and the the deaths of corruption um, here, in, here in, in Mexico. Because they have more money than they ever had before uh, to, for instance, purchase elections, to uh, purchase hitmen. You know, so it's a it's a it's a pretty dangerous situation we're living here in Mexico right now. Well, in the little time that we have left, maybe you could just briefly address also the issue of how the Obama administration has been relating to Mexico and how it could be relating differently. I mean, very briefly. Yes, sure, of course. It's a big question. I mean, uh, you know, read the article in Foreign Affairs and we can have another uh, interview. I could tell the, but the, 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 the big thing is that Obama has um, totally failed to um, actually innovate in um, bilateral relationships. He pre-promised from his very first campaign, 2008, that he was going to have a, a more open relationship with Mexico, particularly involving civil society, social movements. So this was not just going to be relations between elites, political and economic elites, but between the peoples of America, and the, of the United States, and, and Mexico, as it should be, because there are almost 30 million Mexicans in the United States, many Americans in Mexico. This is natural. But Obama has failed. He's just he and Hillary Clinton have just uh, left this at the level of of uh, elite politics. When they come to uh, Mexico, they just deal with the the oligarchs, with the the same old corrupt police politicians as uh, as always. Um, Biden was just here yesterday. It was uh, you know a, a, a case in point of what of, of what's wrong with this with this relationship. Um, you know the hope was that someone like Bernie Sanders, if he ever gets to uh, um, the White House, that we'd be able to actually innovate and create a more sort of grassroots um, bilateral relationship. But um, what we've been seeing so far is a uh, uh, a real disappointment for anybody who would expect the United States to defend human rights or, 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 or honesty in government. It's just been complete pragmatism, national security, oil, and um, um, patting on the back of the, uh, the, the corrupt, repressive leaders we have here in Mexico. Well, we're out of time, so, but we definitely want to keep uh, an eye on what's going on in Mexico. It's such a large country just to the south of the United States. Um, but thanks so much for joining us, John. Thank you so much. It's an honor and a pleasure. I'd love to be in touch again in the future. Okay. And thank you for joining us at The Real News Network.